first before starting surgery, you want to go ahead and set up your operating room table, making sure that you put the instruments you'll use most commonly towards the front of the table. You'll perform a sponge count, which will be the first of two sponge counts you'll perform throughout the procedure. This is to ensure that we are aware of the number of sponges we have on the table and ensure that we have the correct number at the end of surgery before closing the abdomen. In part of setting up your table, be sure to load your blade onto the barred Parker handle using your needle driver. This is for safety purposes to prevent cutting your glove or your skin. At this point, you'll prepare your drapes and make sure that they are set to be placed on the patient appropriately, so unfold the drape and open it up, letting it fall in front of you, making sure it doesn't touch any other items around you, specifically the patient table. You'll wanna make sure that there is a fold pointed towards the patient, so it'll be double layered so that the closer to the major surgical field. And your first place will be draped cranially directly at the xiphoid of the patient. Make sure to feel for the xiphoid through the drape to ensure that it's placed properly. Take the small end, pull that out. Your next drape, and note that fold when away from the surgeon. I'm trying to catch that the fold is going to be towards the patient. It will be placed haughtily at the pubis. And again, you can pop it through the drape to ensure that you feel the pubic bone. Laterally, your landmarks will be the mammary glands. And so you'll just cover the mammary glands and place towel clamps at the closest aspect of the drape to the surgical field right on the corners. You can place another towel clamp right along the, the midpoint of the lengthwise aspect of the surgical field to help keep the drape in place. And finally, your last drape will be placed on your last lateral field margin, and you can place your towel clamps. If you have any trouble getting the towel clamps to engage the skin, holding them completely perpendicular to the body wall uh, will actually help to engage them within the skin. And there we're just pointing out the umbilicus, which should be at the middle of your surgical field. If you're a right-handed surgeon, you wanna stand on the right side of the dog. If you're a left-handed surgeon, you would stand on the left side. From the umbilicus to the end of your incision should measure roughly six to eight centimeters. And your incision should start exactly at the umbilicus and extend along midline caudally that six to eight centimeter length. Note that the blade is not being lifted from the skin, but the surgeon's left hand is actually moving to tension the skin to allow the blade to cut most efficiently. Once you're through the skin, it's a little bit less of a concern if you have to pick up and put your blade back down. So here we're just cutting through the subcutaneous tissue and I'm moving the subcutaneous tissue back and forth to see if it moves readily over the body wall. If there's still a lot of motion there, uh, then chances are you still have more tissue to incise through. And at this point, you should be able to see your linea to make sure that you're going along the linea with your incision. All right, so now when I move the subcutaneous tissue back and forth, there's not a lot of motion over the linea. So I can feel confident that I've incised through a majority of the subcutaneous tissue and have exposed the linea properly. And there is the linea which is the meeting point of the external rectus sheath for the rectus abdominis muscles. Now we'll go ahead and tension the sub Q and create a tent so that we can sharply dissect this tissue away from the linea, which will help with our closure later. So by putting tension on the subcutaneous tissue, you can see exactly where it attaches to the body wall and then Create a small tunnel with the tips of your bombs. Separate that sub Q from the underlying body wall by gently opening up the tips of your bombs 
and then cutting that away from the body wall. Here you can see where that subcutaneous tissue is very tightly adhered to the linea. So we've created a tunnel and we'll go ahead and incise right along that body wall. Tunnel, introduce a blade, if you're missing bombs, and incise. You want to make sure that you continue this all the way to the very proximal and very caudal aspect of your incision or cranial and caudal aspect of your incision to expose your linea along the entire length of the incision. At this point, you want to take your Adson thumb forceps or your rat tooth thumb forceps and really get a good grasp of the abdominal wall and pull out and away from the abdomen. And that way we can create a nice tent so when we do our 45 degree inverse stab incision, we can be sure that we are not going to be stabbing any underlying organs. So stab in and then pull your blade up towards your thumb forceps in order to extend that incision long enough so that you can put your pinky in or some finger in and make sure that there are no adhesions to the peritoneum. At this point, feeling confident that nothing is adhered to midline, you want to use your brown adds and thumb forceps, not your rat tooths and in, introduce them through your incision, pull up or uh, towards the ceiling to really expose that midline and again, keep the body wall and linea away from underlying organs and then create a slide cut along the length of the exposed linea. At this point, you should have exposure of your mesentery and omentum actually omental fat that you can see through the incision and then you can start looking for your ovaries and your uterine body that was a spleen intestinal loop small intestine and what we're doing here is looking for the bladder because I know if I can find the bladder and retract that laterally in one way or the other that dorsal to it I should find the uterine body which is going to be the easiest way to find the structures you're looking for so in a close-up, I'm retracting the bladder towards me, cranial is towards the right, and underneath that was a uterine body. So here's my uterine body and uterine horns exposed. I'm going to follow that left uterine horn cranially by gently putting a little bit of tension on the uterine horn, not on the broad ligament because I don't want to tear that or any of the vessels within the broad ligament. And you can have your assistant retract the lateral body wall towards them and sort of push down on it as well to give you a little bit better exposure into the abdomen. And here I've exposed the proper ligament and the ovary. So here I'm pointing out that white ligamentous band just caudal to the ovary and the ovarian bursa. So that is the proper ligament. And then I'm pointing out the ovarian bursa there. And then just cranial to that is going to be the suspensory ligament, which is that taut ligament that keeps the ovary very well adhered to the dorsal body wall. So you can see that tight band there that I'm pointing out. That is going to be your suspensory ligament. And then you can see your vasculature of your ovarian pedicles. If you notice, that is going to go down to the body wall at a 90 degree angle to the ovary, whereas your suspensory ligament moves at a cranial angle. And so to break down the suspensory ligament, you're going to want to grab that mosquito forcep in your palm and actually use your fingertips of that same hand to grab the ovary and make sure that you don't tear the uh, uterine body or a uterine horn away from the ovary. And this way you've tensioned that suspensory ligament. You can follow it all the way down to the body wall with that left hand and then gently twist it, putting pressure laterally in order to break that down. You really just need to break it down enough to give yourself plenty of exposure of that ovarian pedicle such that you feel comfortable placing two clamps on the pedicle and still having plenty of room to place your ligatures without impeding on the ovarian bursa. Here I'm pointing out the hole in the area within the broad ligament, which you're going to create your window in order to place your clamps. So I've made that window in the avascular portion. Notice how I'm spreading my, um, my clamps in a 
dorsal to ventral direction instead of side to side, and that's going to prevent tearing of any vessels. So here I have a grip on the ovary and the clamp on the, pet, on the suspensory ligament, and I'm placing a clamp, my proximal clamp, on the ovarian pedicle. I've got plenty of exposure. I want to make sure that I have room for at least two clamps with five millimeters of tissue between them. And this more distal clamp should be at least five millimeters away from the ovarian bursa in order to make sure that we're not going to have a ligature that impinges on that in any way and potentially leaves ovary behind. Now I'm going to remove that mosquito from the suspensory ligament and I'm going to replace it with a Kelly hemostat all the way across the uterine horn. And this is gonna prevent back bleeding when we incise um, the ovarian pedicle later. So here's our clamp placement. This is a modified three clamp technique. And ideally you want your clamps so that the handles are facing your assistant. Sometimes we don't remember to do this, but this will make your assistant's life and your life a little bit easier and help them to be able to manipulate the tissue for you. So our first ligature, we use PDS for our ovarian ligatures. You're gonna place a circumferential ligature and your first throw will be a surgeon's throw. You're gonna go ahead and tighten that down. And as you tighten, you'll ask your assistant to remove the most proximal clamp so that you can tighten this ligature in the tissue that's been crushed by that clamp. So here the assistant is removing the clamp and the ligature is being tightened. You want to make sure you put adequate, slow, consistent pressure so that stays in place and stays tight and creates a nice waist and blanches the tissue. So if your end of the suture tears like that, you just want to make sure to retighten your suture. And on top of your surgeon's throw, you're going to place three square throws for a total of four throws. And then you want to cut your suture tags to about five millimeters in length. Your next ligature is going to be placed between your clamp and the first ligature. And this is going to be a Miller's knot or a modified Miller's knot. You guys have your choice in terms of what you want to place. This is a modified Miller's knot that's being shown. It's a little bit more technically challenging. But it's essentially a, um, a tension knot that is resistant to pulling apart once it's tightened. So as I tighten this down, I'm going to ask my assistant to flash the clamp, meaning they're going to open it just slightly so that I can tighten this suture and this ligature, making sure to not tie it on top of my other ligature. There should be a good two to three millimeters of distance between my two ligatures to make sure that they're acting independently. And again, on top of that Miller's throw, you're going to place three square throws. And once that first throw of your Miller's knot is tightened, you can have your assistant reclamp that clamp. So now you can feel your ovary between your two remaining clamps, and you're going to incise just distal to the most proximal clamp, so your remaining carmalt. You want to make sure that you incise away from yourself and away from the patient, making sure that you're not cutting anything else other than that ovarian pedicle. So now with your two clamps in place, you can ensure that there will be no bleeding, either from the ovarian pedicle, if any, there's a problem with any of your ligatures, or from the uterine artery that's still intact on the uterine horn. At this point, you wanna grab your ovarian pedicle, make sure you inspect your ligatures and you're happy with both of them, that they're tight and appropriately placed and positioned. And you wanna grab either distal to your ligatures or between the two ligatures with a thumb forcep, only at the very edge of the tissue, and then release your clamp so you can inspect for any bleeding. You wanna release a little tension on it before you let it go back into the body to make sure there's no bleeding. And we'll recheck this pedicle again before we close. Now you can put tension on that left uterine horn to expose the uterine body and then your right uterine horn, which you'll then follow up proximally the same way you did with the left uterine horn to find the suspensory ligament and the ovary.
as you follow the right uterine horn cranially, you can see your proper ligament, the ovarian bursa, and again, tightening those two things, you can see the suspensory ligament and your ovarian pedicle. And there's a nice avascular area of the broad ligament, which you will be creating a hole later so that you can clamp your pedicle. So holding on to the ovary and the mosquito, we're creating ventral and caudal tension on that suspensory ligament so that we're able to break that down as much as we need to to expose our ovary and our ovarian pedicle to place our clamps. You can see that vasculature very well of the ovarian pedicle. We'll create our window with a caramel in a dorsal to ventral direction, and then place our first caramel clamp proximally, making sure that we don't engage any other tissue in that clamp. It's a little bit more challenging on the right side than it is on the left. And notice that I'm reassessing my ovarian bursa to make sure that it's far enough away from my clamp that I'll still be able to place a second clamp, and I'm not happy with the distance, and so I'm gonna slide that clamp a little bit more proximal and then put on my second clamp on my ovarian pedicle. Again, another car malt with the handles facing towards my assistant so they can handle those more easily. I'll remove the mosquito and place a Kelly distal to the ovary across the uterine horn and that uterine vasculature. Again, my most proximal ligature will be a circumferential ligature where I place a surgeon's throw as my first throw. I'll tighten that, have my assistant remove the most proximal clamp, and then tighten that ligature over where the clamped tissue was. Get a nice tight throw, and then place three additional square throws on top. Cut my tags to five millimeters. And notice how my assistant can very easily handle the clamps for me to create visibility. Here I'm gonna be placing a modified Miller's again. And as I start to tighten this, I'll ask my assistant to flash the clamp to restore the shape of the ovarian pedicle so that I can get this ligature nice and tight and not have it slide into my first ligature. So we have to push that a little bit up towards the, where the clamp is. And then tighten to make sure that it's not sitting directly over my most proximal ligature, and as I tighten and hold that tight, I have my assistant reclamp the clamp, and then I place three additional square throws. I then like to palpate and make sure that my ovary is not impinged by either of the clamps before I go ahead and incise my ovarian pedicle. I like to hold the clamp myself so that I have control of it. Again, I'm cutting away from the patient, away from my body, retracting that uterine horn caudally. Now I have access to that clamp. I'm going to grasp just the very end of the pedicle, not on top of any either of my ligatures. I don't want to go all the way across with my thumb forcep either, so I don't occlude any of the vasculature. I just want to make sure that there is no bleeding from that pedicle before I release it back into the abdomen. Now at this point, I have both of my uterine horns exposed, and now we're going to go ahead and break down that broad ligament on either side, as well as the round ligament, which can look like a very taut band, sometimes can trick you into thinking that there is another vessel there. 
that's not the case. It's just a round ligament, which is the remnant of the gubernaculum in the female reproductive tract. So here, that's the round ligament there. And then the rest of that is broad ligament. And you want to be able to make sure that you can see the cervix, or at least palpate the cervix, which is what I'm showing there. It's going to feel like a very thick, firm, almost bean-like structure in the uterine body. And so starting laterally and caudally, I'm going to break down my broad ligament. So what I'm demonstrating here is the vasculature, the ovarian artery, I'm sorry, the uterine artery and vein that run alongside the uterine body and then along the uterine horns. So by pulling on the broad ligament and working laterally, you'll have very little risk of damaging those vessels and then ultimately breaking down the round ligament most laterally. And once you do that, you'll free up that uterine body quite well. And we just do this with blunt tearing of the tissue, which causes any small capillaries to vasoconstrict. If you do have a more vascular broad ligament, sometimes we do place ligatures in order to prevent bleeding from the broad ligament. So now we have excellent exposure of our uterine body, and you can see the cervix as that pale structure closest to the clamp, which is caudal, or closest to the retractor, which is caudal there, as it's pointing out. And we're going to place our clamps using a three clamp technique, starting about a centimeter distal to the cervix. And you'll see that I'm placing the clamps in sort of an alternating direction. That's just by choice. It helps to keep everything outside of the abdomen and keep things exposed. So again, at the bottom of the screen, it's going to be more dorsal. At the top of the screen, it's going to be cranial. So my first ligature, it's going to be the most proximal, which is going to be just in front of the cervix, about five millimeters to a centimeter away from the cervix. And this is going to be a circumferential ligature using a surgeon's throw. Again, you can see when you place the clamps towards you, it makes it a little bit more awkward because you have to do all the work. But I'm going to remove that clamp and tie this, this ligature into the area where that crushed tissue is that was created. You can see that I broke my suture, so I don't need to replace the clamp. That tissue will still be very apparent where the clamp was. It will be nice and flattened. And I'll just pass my suture around and place the ligature. So again, it's a surgeon's throw followed by three square throws. Next, I'm going to place a transfixing ligature. So transfixing just means that you're taking a bite of the tissue in order to anchor this ligature around the tissue. It just creates a little bit more security, especially when you have thicker tissue. So I took a bite of the tissue, tied one square throw on one side and then wrapped the long end around. and tied completely circumferentially around the tissue. Now I'm going to incise between my remaining two clamps. Now I can completely remove the reproductive tract and put that towards the back of my table. I'm going to grab my uterine body. 
either distal to my ligatures or between my two ligatures, release the clamp, inspect for any hemorrhage, make sure I'm happy with my ligatures before I release that back into the abdomen. So at this point is another checkpoint where faculty will come over and they will look at all of your pedicles. Once you're in practice, this is a nice, easy thing you can do to look for any active bleeding is just using a piece of gauze at the end of a blunt instrument in order to see if there's any true hemorrhage. What you can see there is more serous sanguineous fluid. Before you close, you'll want to inspect both of your ovarian bursa. So incise into the bursa to inspect the ovary and make sure that there are no cut edges to either ovary, which would indicate that perhaps you've left some ovarian tissue behind. This could lead to ovarian remnant syndrome and stump pyometra in the future. You can see there the ovary is intact. Looks quite normal. And next we are going to close. So you can see the external rectus sheath, which is gonna be the holding layer of the abdominal wall. It's a thick, taut fascial tissue that sits directly over the rectus abdominis. And that is truly the holding layer, meaning that you should not be aiming to get full thickness bites of the abdominal wall. You really just wanna be engaging that external rectus sheath. Starting at the center, we do a simple interrupted suture using a surgeon's throw, followed by three square throws. And the idea is that these should be tight, but not strangulating to the tissue. By starting in the center, it helps you take tension away off of the rest of your closure. And we'll be using PDS for closure for our patients. Again, I'm pulling back that sub Q using my needle just to expose that external rectus sheath. Taking a bite. Your bites should be about five millimeters away from the incision edge. So nice wide bites. And here you can see me splitting the difference as I go along. Certainly once you place that middle suture, you can place the remainder of your sutures however you choose. Ultimately, these sutures should be five millimeters apart from each other, such that no small intestinal loop or other abdominal contents could slip between your sutures. And you and your partner should share this part of the closure. It's a good experience and it's important to be able to identify that external rectus sheath. It's important to make sure that you have enough exposure of the most cranial and most caudal aspects of this incision to prevent leaving any defect in the body wall. By ensuring you're not taking full thickness bites of the abdominal wall and only getting the rectus abdominis or uh, the external rectus sheath, you're actually preventing 
internal um, or inversion of your rectus sheath and creating a nice tight appositional closure. If you have concerns about spacing of your suture, you can use the tip of a mosquito to see if it easily goes into the abdominal cavity between your sutures. If it does, then you can consider placing another suture in the area where there is a defect, like what's seen here. Faculty will be checking your external rectus sheath closures to ensure that there's no risk of potential herniation following surgery. So at this point, we're ready for our subcutaneous closure. I'm just using some warm saline to clean up the incision and clean the subcutaneous tissue. So starting with a deep to superficial bite on the side closest to me, I'm going to go ahead and create a buried knot for my continuous subcutaneous closure. Typically we use monocryl for closing the subcutaneous tissues. And this layered closure is really meant to help close up dead space as well as to bring your skin into good apposition. And we can keep the tag short here because we want these to stay buried. So at this point, to keep my knot buried, I'm going to take another deep to superficial bite, which will help to keep my knot in that deep layer. And now I can start my normal closure and continuous bites. Notice I am picking up the subcutaneous tissues just deep to my dermis and not grabbing the whole subcutaneous layer. This will help prevent uh, pooching of that subcutaneous tissue into the center of your incision and help to bring the skin into better apposition. At no point during this closure, Am I getting into the subcuticular or, um, or dermis? But taking bites closer to the, the center in my sub-Q would prevent good apposition of the skin. And these bites you can pull nice and tight. So when I'm ready to create a deep loop, I'm doing the same throws that I've done all along. I'm gonna go superficial to deep on the side away from me, deep to superficial on the side towards me, and that's gonna create a deep loop. And then from here, all I have to do is create a deep tag by taking another superficial to deep bite on the side away from me. I'm bringing that up in the center of the incision, creating two little elephant ears and a trunk in the center. And I'll put tension on this as I tighten that throw along the length of the incision, which just sometimes helps to bury it a little bit better. Remember when tying to a loop, you wanna keep your needle drivers open to make sure you're applying even tension on both of those arms of the loop. And those suture tags should be cut to two to three millimeters in length. Now we're gonna close the skin with cruciate sutures. So these are appositional sutures. For skin closure, remember your sutures should be appositional, but loose. And they should only engage the dermis and not the subcutaneous tissues. The skin is probably one of the most sensitive tissues that we work with, and therefore we minimize and avoid grabbing it with our thumb forceps as much as possible. And so what you can see happening here is I'm actually grabbing the subcutaneous tissue with my thumb forceps, 
in order to create tension on that skin to make it easier to pass my needle. This is 3 aught ethylon or 3 aught nylon, which comes on a reverse cutting needle, which does uh, penetrate the skin quite well with that needle. And that first throw is going to be nice and loose. Second throw, also fairly loose. I'm going to tighten it just enough to sort of touch so those two throws touch. My third throw, I'm going to make sure it comes together nicely. And that fourth throw, I can really pull tightly. I want to make sure this throw is loose enough, or this suture is loose enough, so that I can pass the tip of a mosquito underneath both arms up to the level of the box clamp. So that seems very loose, but you'll get quite a bit of soft tissue swelling of the skin. And so if you place these too tightly, it can be very, very irritating to the patient and make them more inclined to want to bite out their sutures or lick at their incision. How far apart you need to place your skin sutures is dependent upon how well opposed your skin is following your subcutaneous closure. So if your skin is very well opposed, you can probably get away with placing your skin sutures almost up to a centimeter apart. If you've got poor apposition of your skin, you'll probably need to place your skin sutures a little bit closer. But as I take my bites with my cruciate sutures, I am, again, taking a bite about five millimeters away from the skin edge on either side, and then five millimeters apart or up to a centimeter apart, creating a nice box or a smaller tri or a rectangle, rather. You want to make sure you don't pull too hard on that second throw, because even though you are creating a knot, it can still slip quite a bit and, and tighten the suture. Nylon is monofilament, it's quite slippery. Now we have nice closure. 